Hello, and welcome to the Weatherization Plus Health session of the Innovations in Energy Efficiency webinar series. My name is Kelly Canada, and I'm a program analyst in the Energy Branch of the Office of Public and Indian Housing. This webinar describes weatherization as a practice and the U.S. Department of Energy's Weatherization Assistance Program. Presenters will discuss the activities that are conducted when weatherizing a home, such as protecting a home's interior from the elements, such as sunlight, rain, and wind, and modifying a building to reduce energy consumption and optimize energy efficiency. DOE's Weatherization Assistance Program is a comprehensive whole building approach to energy efficiency retrofits, with the mission of reducing the energy burden of low-income households while also ensuring their health and safety. These items are interrelated because in many cases, providing air sealing plus ventilation improves the air quality and health of the occupants inside the building. Weatherization plus health is a voluntary effort designed to take a comprehensive approach to coordinate resources for energy, health, and safety in low-income homes. This session has two parts, a technical program and a question and answer period with all of the presenters. Please utilize the Q&A function within Zoom to submit any questions that you have. At the conclusion of the technical program, we'll address as many of these questions as we can. We encourage everyone to submit questions throughout the presentations. You do not need to wait until the end to submit your questions. As a reminder, all webinars in this webinar series will be recorded and posted to HUD's YouTube channel. The recorded sessions will be posted approximately two weeks after the conclusion of the webinar series. The first speaker of today's technical program is Paul Francisco. Paul is an Associate Director for Building Science at the University of Illinois and is a Senior Researcher at Colorado State University. He conducts research on energy efficiency in healthy housing with a focus on field measurements and retrofit homes. He also runs an accredited training center for weatherization professionals and provides practitioners with education to improve the efficiency and health of clients' homes. Take it away, Paul. Hey, thank you, Kelly, for that introduction. So again, I'm Paul Francisco. I'm at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I'll be talking about weatherization and weatherization plus health. So learning objectives, the ones from my talk here are the ones in red. Later talks are, are uh, the learning objectives are below. So for this portion of this seminar, going to be um, making it so that people can describe weatherization, and weatherization plus health and the difference between the two, recognize modern weatherization measures, discuss how building science and audits guide the selection of measures installed with program dollars, and describe the principles of cost effectiveness and the savings to investment ratio. So first, what is weatherization? So the mission statement for the low income weatherization program is as follows, to reduce energy costs for low income families, particularly for the elderly, people with disabilities and children by improving the energy efficiency of their homes while ensuring their health and safety. And that last piece, while ensuring their health and safety is key in this program. Now it does follow the do no harm principle. So what do we mean by the do no harm principle? Well, at fundamental level, make sure that the pursuit of energy savings doesn't cause people to become sick. You know, it's it's not worth the energy savings to impact people's health. So don't impact people's health while pursuing energy savings. On the other hand, it's not trying to address everything. So if there are pre-existing issues that are not a part of what the program is there to do, you know, those are gonna stick around. Um, you know, we're not going in and trying to fix every health and safety issue. Now the Weatherization Assistance Program or WAP has always, from its inception over 40 years ago, tried to address health and safety, including sponsoring research targeted at improving our understanding of how weatherization impacts um, things that can impact your health and safety, and how do we make it so that we can at least maintain the do no harm principle. And we may see improvements, and that's great. We're certainly not going to turn improvements away, but we at first want to make sure we do no harm. So some health and safety issues are certainly related to energy measures. There is a clear link between any of these. So for example, when we do air sealing, that's really important for energy savings, especially keeping really cold air come, from coming into the house in the middle of the winter. 
and due to building science principles stack effect in the middle of winter you get a lot more ventilation through leaks in the home than you do at more mild conditions so it's really expensive in the middle of winter in many locations for those leaks to occur so we want to air seal those to save energy but in the meantime then we may be in increasing indoor contaminant levels if we don't do anything to address that and so it ends up being that we also put in ventilation as well as ground covers over bare dirt and foundation spaces to keep moisture and other uh, soil contaminants from coming into the house as much so that's how we keep those indoor contaminants from increasing while we're still doing our weatherization measures Another example is when we put in a new furnace. Oftentimes the new furnace is an entirely different technology, the high efficiency condensing furnaces that you'll see having the uh, plastic PVC piping. If previously there was a, a lower efficiency furnace that was perhaps common vented with a water heater, meaning their flues joined together before going up and out of the house, we may need to install what's called a chimney liner in order to help make sure that those water heaters draft properly. Uh, we also may need to update the gas piping. We're not gonna update the gas piping in every house, but if we're gonna replace a new furnace and it has outdated gas piping, we will go ahead and update that gas piping to meet current codes because now it is associated with one of our weatherization measures. So you can see how the work we're doing in weatherization does connect directly to certain health and safety issues. On the other hand, there are some measures that are just really beyond the scope. There's a limited budget per home and we just can't do everything. So for example, if you have friable asbestos on pipes, which you see in the right-hand picture, they're friable meaning it's starting to crumble, or large amounts of vermiculite, or really any substantial amount of vermiculite, which you see in the middle photo, vermiculite can contain asbestos. So if we see that, those are not things we can deal with. Now we may be able to continue weatherizing the house in, in those particular cases, but we're not gonna be able to do certain things. For example, for that middle photo, most agencies, most states are going to not do anything in the attic. They may do other things in the home. Some states will just defer the home unless that gets uh, removed by, by a licensed professional. But in the absence of getting it removed, people are not going to do measures in the attic, which means some energy efficiency measures end up getting skipped. Other things that are beyond the scope of weatherization is large scale mold, like you can see over on the left hand picture, deteriorated roofs, high radon levels. You know, for example, with high radon levels, we try to do measures that keep it from getting higher but we're not gonna be doing full-scale radon mitigation to get it to below the EPA action level. So these are measures that just generally cost too much within the scope of weatherization to be able to cover. And so we end up either deferring the home um, unless these issues get resolved or, or avoiding dealing with those certain areas. So, let me talk a little bit about what common weatherization measures are. So I'll first talk about measures that are focused on energy. So we do attic insulation, wall insulation, air sealing that's in bold because the photo that came up is showing an, an example of a substantial air sealing measure where there was an opening in, in the uh, building cavities that got sealed with foam. And then heating system replacement. Those are what we consider the big four energy measures. It is putting those in that tend to save the most energy in a home. Other measures that can also save a substantial amount are duct sealing and duct insulation. And in some homes where you've got substantial leakage from the ducts to unconditioned spaces such as attics and vented crawl spaces, that can actually be the single biggest energy penalty in a home. Cooling systems also can be a substantial uh, energy savings opportunity. We also do baseload measures such as efficient lighting and efficient refrigerators. Another one is windows and doors. I put that in red and italics because those are often measures that residents really are hoping that we will be able to do, but they usually do not turn out to be cost effective. They can be cost effective in limited cases, uh, especially if they are the source of the big air leaks, like 
broken doors and broken windows, but then that goes back up to that air ceiling. So, but windows and doors, they do sometimes get done, but it's not particularly often. Okay, now what about health and safety measures that are common in weatherization? Well, one is ventilation, according to the ASHRAE standard, 62.2. Also well-installed ground covers and foundations. That's the photo on the right. That's why I've got that bolded. And that helps to keep that moisture and other soil gases from coming into the home. Sealed sump pump covers and combustion safety. The sealed sump pump covers are helping, again, to keep soil contaminants and moisture from coming into the home. Combustion safety is to make sure that our water heaters and furnaces are venting properly, that our gas ranges do not have particularly high levels of carbon monoxide, et cetera. So the measure selection, when people are doing these, uh, figuring out what measures to do in a home, it's really based on a rigorous audit. So it starts after doing a client interview, the first thing we always do is to talk to the client. Once that's done, really the first thing that is done beyond that is to go through the home and evaluate whether there are any serious health and safety concerns. So in some cases that something is identified, it's like, wait a minute, this house has a really major health and safety issue that's gonna prevent us from being able to do our measures effectively. We're gonna to have to defer the home. So we aren't gonna spend the rest of the time doing the audit if we're not gonna be able to work on the home at the time. It can also identify things that we know we are going to be able to deal with and now we know about those. So we always start with the health and safety walkthrough. Once we've done that, we look for visual observations of, of, of problems, problems with insulation levels, this photo here, significant missing insulation, and then the insulation that is there is kind of propped up so it's not being effective. So it's demonstrating that there are clear opportunities in this home for at least insulation retrofits to be done to really substantially save energy in this home. We also do a lot of diagnostics. This is a highly technical measurement-based program. So we do blower door testing. That's the photo with the big red thing in the door that identifies how much air leakage there is in the home. Zone pressure diagnostics, which can help determine where those air leaks are. Duct leakage measurements to determine whether the ducts are leaking a lot of their energy uh, to unconditioned spaces. Combustion safety, such as the photo on the right where we're checking the uh, carbon monoxide levels and uh, in the flu, well, in, from a water heater. We also assess the ventilation. Do we have enough ventilation? And if not, what can we do to, what do we need to do to improve the ventilation? And then also assessing the space conditioning system. Now the combustion safety and ventilation assessments there, those who are clearly focused on the health and safety side the rest of them are largely focused on energy, although there are some additional health and safety things, particularly related to the assessment of the space conditioning systems. And really, it's all looking at it as a house as a system. We know that if we do some things over here in one part of the house, it can affect the other parts of the house as well. So, you know, for example, when we do our air sealing, how is that affecting our indoor air quality? When we do insulation, how does that affect how the heating and cooling system will run? Because now it doesn't have as big of a heating load. So we really are focused on having the house as an entire system, not a bunch of individual components. Now, when these measures are selected, uh, yeah, how do they get selected? The audit is done. A lot of stuff has been figured out. And then the data are input into either modeling software or a priority list. The priority list would be things like if there isn't attic insulation, that ends up being a high priority. But if there is, it goes down in the priority list. A lot of states use modeling software to go through and use energy for engineering calculations to determine what are the most cost effective measures. In order for a measure to be installed from an energy perspective, it must meet an SIR of at least one and then they get ranked and you go from the highest to the lowest until you either run out of measures that have that SIR of one or you've run out of money. Now, what is SIR? SIR is the savings to investment ratio. It's based on the cost to install the measure, what the first year savings is, how long we expect the measure to uh, be have useful life, and it has projections on the fuel cost escalation. So it'll vary depending on whether it's gas, heat, or propane heat or electric heat, for example. And basically we can look at the SIRs, how many times over the expected life of the measure will it pay for itself? 
So an SIR of one means it'll pay for itself exactly once over its expected lifetime. An SIR of two means it would pay for itself twice over the expected lifetime. Health and safety measures are exempt from the SIR calculations because we know that they're not there to save energy. They're there to enable us to save energy. But there is a limited percentage of the overall budget that can go towards health and safety measures. It's typically on the order of 15 to 25% of the budget, depending on what the state has put into their state plan. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about weatherization and health. This is not weatherization plus health, this is weatherization and health. So this is how weatherization, normal weatherization can impact health. So we start here with the eight key principles of a healthy home, dry, clean, pest-free, ventilated, safe, contaminant-free, maintained and climate controlled. The idea here, is if you can keep a home each of these eight things, then it should be a healthy home. Well, we first have to get the home to be dry, clean, et cetera. But this is the focus on a healthy home. So we do things already just in normal weatherization to keep the home dry, ground covers, ventilation. Um, we can do things to keep it ventilated. We add the ventilation required by the program. There are some keep it safe, not everything of safety is in there, but for example, combustion safety is definitely in the program. Uh, for keep it maintained, a lot of times, you know, anytime we have a home that's pre-1978, we have to make sure that we're implementing lead safe work practices because those are homes that may have lead-based paint. And so there is some maintenance there to make sure that we are not causing there to be lead dust that could uh, be ingested by the residents, especially to small children. And then climate control, that's the main thing the program is about. Insulation, air sealing, efficient space conditioning. But we don't do all of the keep it principles in the weatherization program, at least not in a significant way. We're not really doing things about keeping it clean, keeping it contaminant free beyond ventilation. Yeah, we do the ventilation, but we're not identifying specific contaminants that may be getting into the air and figuring out how to deal with them. It's really, you put in the ventilation, and base it on that. Um, the other thing that targets maybe specific contaminants is the ground covers because it's contaminants that can be in the soil. We don't really do targeted pest-free measures. We may improve its resistance to pests because of the air sealing, but mostly we're not focused on the pests. And a lot of the keep it safe aspects, such as uh, primarily focused on injury prevention. For example, we do not typically within weatherization deal with problems with stairs, handrails, grab bars in, in bathrooms and showers, things like that. Um, and so because of that, the fact that we've done weatherization and we're not addressing everything, existing issues can continue to impact people's health. We're really focused again on the do no harm for the measures that weatherization is doing. Now there are some studies that have shown that there are health benefits to weatherization even without being targeted at health, and also some health problems that have that are related to issues that are addressed by weatherization. So, for example, we know that there are many health effects from different contaminants, and ventilation and moisture control can really improve uh, the conditions in the home for that. We can get it towards keeping it dry and fewer contaminants, which can obviously improve health. Uh, there was a study done back in 2003 that found that for low-income families, when it got cold into the heating season, their nutrition got worse. They're having to spend money keeping warm rather than uh, spending it on high quality food. And so they end up having worse nutrition relative to say middle income families. So if we can reduce their heating load, they could potentially have better nutrition. And there was a DOE report shown here on the right that found evidence that the weatherization energy efficiency retrofits uh, resulted in improvements in many respiratory health health issues. Now I'll talk about weatherization plus health. So this is when we're trying to go beyond. Weatherization plus health is an approach where we try to bring the weatherization program that's already getting into tens of thousands of homes every year. While they're there, let's do other things that are focused on health as well, which means you have to partner. You have to leverage different programs but it's gonna be so much easier to do it once when you're in there in the home in the first place. So bring weatherization together with radon programs, lead prevention programs, or lead remediation programs, the HUD home program, 
asthma coalitions, local health departments, et cetera. There, there are many potential programs that could be brought together that while you're in the home, let's leverage these resources and do more to really help people. Can also incorporate things that are really specific to a local community. Religious groups, hardware stores, community groups, fire departments, all of them may have something that can be brought in to help beyond what would normally be done with weatherization. Um, there are some programs where in this weatherization plus health model, they have a single application. So that depending on their eligibility, based on income and other factors, they can immediately qualify for, for potentially multiple different programs, which allows us to then more seamlessly implement a wider range of measures to not only save energy, but really try to improve health, not just do no harm, but improve health. So again, it really has the understanding that we have a lot of programs trying to help people, but they all have their limitations. They all have their specific focus. So how can we do it in, a, in an efficient manner and bring these resources together? So it's all done at the same time. There's economies of scale there. Fewer disturbances for the residents while they're letting people in. Um, and in some cases, it can remove barriers to getting the weatherization done. And I've talked about some of these issues. You, there's some examples here on the bottom, deteriorating lead-based paint on the left, a lot of clutter in the middle, serious, serious mold on the right. These are things that weatherization is not really able to address themselves. And so we end up seeing a lot of homes getting deferred. So they get no help at all. But if we can bring these things together, we can potentially address some of these health hazards up front. And now we can also do the weatherization. So instead of getting nothing, they get a lot, a lot of help. So summary, weatherization assistance program, it's, it's really a science-based approach to energy retrofits. We focus on the house as a system model, not again, just individual kind of siloed measures, but how it all comes together and how we can truly improve the home in a comprehensive way. It does and has always addressed health and safety but it is limited. It isn't really able to go beyond what is related to the weatherization measures. And when there are really serious issues, homes can be deferred. And we do have limited budgets to work with. Um, the weatherization plus health is really intended to combine resources and provide residents with what every, every family really deserves, a home that's efficient and healthy. Here are some resources. Uh, the top one there is that DOE study that I mentioned earlier. There are a couple of studies from the National Weatherization Assistance Program Evaluation that was done about a decade ago, back in 2010, thereabouts. Uh, one was an inter air quality study. One was uh, an evaluation of health benefits. So those links are there. Uh, NASCASP has on their website, a Weatherization Plus Health page it's a bit dated. It was from um, when this concept was really starting to get formed and, and, and promoted back in 2013, but the page is still there. It has some description of what the Weatherization Plus Health model is. I've got the link to that Bhattacharya article. That was the one where they saw improved or saw reduced nutrition when it got cold out for low-income families. And then Washington State specifically has really done a tremendous amount with uh, the state support for doing a weatherization plus health program. So there's a link for their program if you want to learn more from them. So that's what I have. I look forward to the uh, question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for your introduction to weatherization and weatherization plus health. Next up is Amy Klusmeyer. Amy is a weatherization assistance program project officer with the U.S. Department of Energy. Amy started working for the weatherization assistance program as a retrofit installer technician in 2004. After serving as a crew lead, a lead program and policy analyst for the state of Wisconsin weatherization program, and as the weatherization assistance program director for the National Association for State Community Service Pro Programs, Amy joined DOE in January 2021. Amy, over to you. 
Hello, my name is Amy Klusmeyer. I'm a project officer with the U.S. Department of Energy Weatherization Assistance Program, and I'll be providing the presentation today on weatherization plus health. Erica Burren, the DOE Weatherization Program Manager, will be joining you for the live Q&A after the presentation. Today I'm going to provide an overview of the historical perspective of the weatherization program and introduce you to the process for receiving weatherization assistance. You should also, um, I'm going to move pretty quickly through the program history and the, um, the mission of the program and we'll focus on client and building eligibility and future funding outlooks for weatherization. The weatherization program was founded in 1976, and over the 45-year history of the program, uh, we've weatherized over 7 million homes. That's an average of about 35,000 to 40,000 per year, and the program also supports over 8,000 jobs throughout the country. The mission of the weatherization program is primarily to increase the energy efficiency of low-income housing. However, the statutory directive and, and the congressional directive of the program also includes this secondary mission to improve the health and safety of low-income households, especially those households uh, that include persons who are elderly, disabled, and households with children. Those are what we consider the priority categories for weatherization services. Weatherization is a formula-funded grant program, meaning there is an annual appropriation that um, Congress provides to the U.S. Department of Energy. That funding is allocated to 57 weatherization grantees. Most of those grantees are state governments, and the state governments pass that money through to weatherization subgrantees or local agencies. Those local agencies uh, install measures in homes and provide a number of benefits to low-income households. For those of you who are HUD uh, program managers or building owners, you are most likely working with the subgrantees or the local agencies implementing the weatherization program, and those can be community action agencies, nonprofits, and local governments, including tribal governments. This is a look at the historical funding and production of the weatherization assistance program. And this includes that annual allocation from Congress in addition to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act awards. You can see in 2009, the program received over $5 billion and funding has fluctuated since that time. However, we've kind of stabilized around $300 million in 2020 and in 2021. And in recent years, uh, production has lagged a little due to the coronavirus pandemic. We do expect production will be back up to the average of 35 to 40,000 units this program year. All of that funding is used to uh, deliver services to low-income households, and which results in a number of impacts and benefits to the occupants of those homes. In 2014, the Weatherization Assistance Program uh, did a retrospective evaluation, and that evaluation showed that in addition to energy cost savings, there are a number of positive impacts such as water cost savings, health benefits, and lower utility bill payments for low-income households. There are links here to those evaluation studies if you're interested in, in reading more on the monetized savings and the cost benefits uh, that result from weatherization work. Given the topic of today's webinar, I did want to highlight one of those um, areas of benefits, and that is health savings. That There was a uh, study specifically done on health uh, benefits related to the weatherization assistance program. And that study found that uh, estimated $14,000 um, in per weatherized unit was realized in health related benefits. And that results from um, benefits such as uh, homes that are more livable and safer, fewer missed days of work and reduced doctor visits. Weatherization is a comprehensive uh, whole house retrofit program. And this slide is illustrating the measures that are allowable to be done using DOE funds. However, at the local level, 
Um, the local agencies are braiding multiple funding sources to do weatherization work. For example, DOE funds might be used for energy measures such as mechanical measures and building shell measures like insulation. Um, but other fed federal funding sources like HUD or uh, Health and Human Services funding might be used for repairs and health and safety. And even other funding sources like utility funding might be used for electric baseload measures. The process for receiving assistance is shown here in four steps. The first step is the households have to apply and be determined to be income eligible for the program. This is done by the local weatherization agency and um, usually is done by the low income household. But uh, in the case of multifamily buildings, the property owner may also play a role in this. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. Step two is the energy audit, and this is an on-site visit at the building, and it is a comprehensive analysis of the home, which includes a client interview. For multifamily housing, this usually means an interview with the property owner or manager. After the audit, a customized work order is created and measures are installed following the standard work specifications for home energy upgrades. This provides consistent work uh, nationwide. Finally, a quality control inspection is performed on every uh, weatherized unit that uses DOE funding. This inspection is performed by a certified individual at the local level, either a agency staff person or contractor, and it verifies that the work is installed correctly and that the home is safe. I want to talk a little bit more uh, about the step one process, which is related to eligibility. And we really have two types of eligibility for weatherization. There is household eligibility and building eligibility. For household eligibility, income eligibility must be in accordance with DOE rules and regulations. And grantees or the states that administer the program have currently have three options when deciding uh, how to verify eligibility. First, they can use the weatherization definition, which is 200% of the federal poverty level. Second, uh, households that are eligible for supplemental cash assistance payments under the Social Security Act are eligible for weatherization. And third, if the grantee elects, uh, the grantee can choose to use the Health and Human Services or HHS LIHEAP eligibility threshold. LIHEAP is the Low Income Heating and Energy Assistance Program. Um, LIHEAP eligibility uh, can be different uh, at than the DOE eligibility level, but what the grantee typically does is aligns the LIHEAP threshold with the DOE threshold and uses one eligibility criteria for both programs. This really simplifies things for both the grantee and the local agency and the client who's applying for services because it usually means there's one application for both programs. We're very excited to share that coming soon, there will be a fourth option for determining household eligibility, and that is categorical eligibility with HUD uh, means tested programs. What this will mean is that uh, those households that are eligible for HUD services or receiving HUD assistance will be categorically eligible and automatically eligible for weatherization without additional applications needed. This should be announced soon in a um, what we call a weatherization program notice, which is a policy announcement, and Erica Burren will be able to talk in more detail about this during the live Q&A. But this is the current DOE guidance for certifying income-eligible HUD-assisted buildings. Um, this guidance is weatherization program notice 17-4, and it is specific to multifamily housing. And there are two types of properties addressed in the guidance. As you can see, property owners currently have to submit two documents to HUD to certify buildings and verify income eligibility. The first is a self-certification form, and the second is an occupancy report. I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this because when that eligibility change is published and that new policy goes into effect, this guidance will be superseded and this um, will no longer be required to be done for HUD assisted buildings or, or households that receive HUD uh, means tested benefits. So just an illustration here, if you have a, a building that you're currently looking to, um, to um, 
qualify for weatherization services, go to this program notice and it will describe to you the process that needs to be used. Um, but an illustration of how the process will be simplified when we make this policy change, this information will no longer be required um, to be done. What will remain in place moving forward and is currently in place now is the building eligibility criteria. So for owner occupied or rental buildings, the following types of buildings are eligible for weatherization services, site built single family homes, manufactured homes, and multifamily buildings up to 24 units. We do allow larger multifamily buildings to be weatherized with prior approval. In addition to um, meeting one of these building type categories, the building must be structurally sound with no major repair needs. Because weatherization is primarily an energy conservation and efficiency program, any repairs that are done with DOE funds need to be cost effective. This often means that expensive repairs like roof replacements um, cannot be done with DOE funds and the local agency needs to find another funding source to do that work in order for the, build to be, the building to be eligible for weatherization. Um, there is an opportunity here to braid uh, HUD funding with DOE weatherization funding and um, some local agencies have funding available like HOME and CDGB that are used for these purposes. One final note on building eligibility and multifamily buildings specifically is that because weatherization is a whole house program, we will treat the entire building as long as 66% of the dwelling units are income eligible. And for duplexes and four unit buildings, 50% of the, the units have to be income eligible. So as long as a majority of the units in the building are income eligible, we will, weatherization will serve each unit in the building and the building as a whole. So that means the shell and the common area measures within the building. In addition, the subgrantee or the local weatherization agency must obtain written permission of the owner or agent of the building. So you as the HUD property owner or manager will be signing off on the work order before any work is done and agreeing to uh, what the weatherization program will be installing in the building. So that's a very quick overview of both the process for weatherization and building eligibility. And um, Erica will be able to answer any questions on these topics uh, after the presentations today. The final topic um, we're gonna address today is future funding opportunities. And I'll talk about funding in um, in two different ways. First, there is the formula funding, and that is the annual appropriation that Congress provides to DOE for weatherization. The second type of funding is competitive grants. So first on the formula funding, for fiscal year 2022, the amount is yet to be determined. Um, there was a proposal earlier this year for $375 million for weatherization. However, it seems um, likely that we might see a continuing resolution for 2022, and that would be closer to the $310 million um, amount for weatherization. In addition to that money, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was passed on November 5th and signed into law by President Biden provides $3.5 billion for the weatherization assistance program. This means there will be a significant increase in the amount of funds available moving forward um, for weatherization in general and specifically for multifamily and HUD assisted buildings. In addition, we have three new competitive grant programs that will be announced soon. The first is community scale pilots. The second is enhancement and innovation grants. And the third is the sustainable energy resources for consumers grants or CERC. I'll talk about each of the new grant programs in more detail, but the one that's most relevant for this webinar is the enhancement and innovation grant program because that um, has money specifically for healthy homes and weatherization plus health. However, starting with the community scale pilots, this is a relatively small program compared to the other grant programs with $1.5 million currently available. The purpose of the program is to uh, implement place-based approaches to providing weatherization services. And this could be um, weatherizing an entire neighborhood or weatherizing an entire multifamily housing development. Uh, 
This funding will be available to weatherization grantees and subgrantees, and there is more information available in Weatherization Memo 77, which is linked on the screen here. The second grant program is the Enhancement and Innovation Program. This is a new program that was created by Congress and the Weatherization Reauthorization Bill in December of 2020, and it is specifically for four types of activities. The first is major home repairs and weatherization readiness to reduce the deferral rates uh, of, of homes waiting for weatherization services. The second activity is renewable energy. The third activity is healthy homes and enhancing indoor air quality. And the fourth activity is workforce development. There is a, a currently $18.6 million reserved for this program, and we do anticipate more money will be available each year through 2025, depending on the congressional allocation for the program each year. It will be, the funding will be available to weatherization grantees, subgrantees, and other nonprofits. Those are the eligible entities for uh, the program as defined by Congress. And we anticipate uh, a funding opportunity announcement will be published soon. That is currently in development. So even if you're not a grantee or a subgrantee or a nonprofit, you can be named as a partner on these award applications. So if you are interested in the ENI grant or any of the new grants, your first point of contact would be the local weatherization agency um, that is implementing the program in your area. If you are not connected to them currently, uh, we'll provide some contact information at the end of the presentation and uh, you can reach out to us and we'll be happy to connect you with your weatherization grantees and subgrantees. Finally, the third new program is the Sustainable Energy Resources for Consumers uh, grant program. This, this funding is specifically for renewable energy and new technologies, and it is for weatherization subgrantees. Again, the subgrantees um, and the, the local agencies will need to be partnering with a lot of different types of organizations and contractors to implement all of these programs. So um, they will be looking for partners in these efforts. So again, reach out to them as uh, you're interested in these opportunities. There is $12.3 million available currently for the program and we do anticipate additional funding will be available in future years, both from the Infrastructure and Jobs Act and the potentially the annual allocation from Congress, depending on the amount of that allocation. CERC was implemented during uh, the Recovery Act, so we do have some information on prior awards on our website. If you're interested in learning more, there's a link on the slide. So in closing, we, we really are excited about these new funding opportunities. Um, this provides the weatherization agencies with additional resources to um, do more in the homes, braid a lot of funding types, and really have a, a high impact for the low-income families receiving weatherization services. The success of all of these programs is really going to depend on strong local partnerships with you as HUD providers and managers and a number of other um, local organizations and um, programs that weatherization is currently working with. A lot of these funding opportunities also will stress um, new partnerships and growing existing partnerships. So we really encourage you to reach out to your local weatherization agencies serving your areas and connect with them and see how we can work together to maximize the benefits we are providing to low-income households. As I mentioned, we are happy to help connect you with your local weatherization agency. And our email addresses are here. We also included a link to our website that has more information and the provider lists and a link to the gov delivery email uh, list. Everything that DOE publishes uh, from policy changes like the eligibility update to the funding opportunity announcements will be publicly available on gov delivery. So if you're interested in future updates on any of these initiatives, please sign up for the email uh, at the link below. We'd like to thank HUD for inviting us to participate in the webinar series today, and uh, we look forward to working together moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for your presentation on the DOE WAP program. 
The final speaker of this session is Dan Auer. Dan is the project manager for multifamily weatherization for the King County Housing Authority. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Kelly. I want to get started. There's a lot of ground to cover in this presentation. Um, my name is Dan Auer, and I've worked in weatherization for my whole professional career. I was a contractor for a while, and then I work for a housing authority right now. And within the housing authority is an apartment that handles money from the Department of Energy. So I am familiar with HUD properties as well as low income housing providers and the different worlds that Department of Energy and HUD populate. Um, the Department of Energy's program is has been really built around single family residences, but I was uh, hired by King County Housing Authority to work on multifamily buildings 30 years ago. Um, and so I've taken what I've learned working on single family residences and I worked on, uh, on multifamily buildings. The properties that HUD have and the properties that Department of Energy have directed their effort have an awful lot in common. It's the same population of people that we're trying to work on. The uh, work that I do for the Department of Energy uh, in my department, all of that work is contracted out. Uh, we don't do that work. There are there are weatherization agencies that do some of the work in-house, but mostly in Washington State, that work is contracted out. And the work that is contracted out, the, the contractors, uh, their employees, their wages are prevailed upon, just like HUD has wages prevailed upon on the work that they contracted out. Um, the work that I do is all bid out and it meets the HUD purchasing procurement. So we competitively bid and then we, uh, we have oversight of the work that is done. The work that we do in weatherization is different though than, uh, than HUD work is in, but you know, we're all trying to bring uh, safe work practices to the work that we do. And HUD is very much aware of all of the hazards uh, in our housing, whether it's asbestos or lead or uh, combustion safety, not so much. The combustion safety is very much a, uh, a focus of the weatherization industry and indoor air quality improvement. The, you know, the, what we're trying to do in weatherization is improve the indoor air quality and lower the people's utility bills. The buildings that uh, we work on in weatherization and multifamily weatherization, um, I want to be I want to be clear that they're small buildings. They're not when people think of apartment buildings, they think of uh, skyscrapers. And, you know, most of the buildings, 87% in the Pacific Northwest, uh, are three-story buildings or less. They're also buildings that have never been, never had their ventilation systems commissioned. No one ever measured them and saw how well they work. And usually when you do measure them, they don't work well at all. And what we do in weatherization is we'll bring the ventilation standard from ASHRAE to bear on the work that we do. And so we do a lot of work around ventilation. And in multifamily, we also, uh, we're committed to, uh, to doing, to lowering their utility bills and improving the indoor air quality. So we work on the buildings and in a multifamily, what's important to remember is the, you know, the, the benefit that we're bringing is for the residents, but the building that you're working on belongs to someone else and it is their investment. And so it's really important 
that the work that we do is brings value or doesn't detract in value from the investment of the owner. We're very uh, cognizant of that. The principles of weatherization. Um, let me say everyone in weatherization is trained to treat the people who live in the building with respect. I was always impressed with the Department of Energy that there's a real big focus on respecting the people that live there and consult with them about the work that you're going to do. And in multifamily, it's more so important because there's a property manager, there's a building owner, there's, you need to, to interact with those people in a positive manner. Um, that, you know, we have guidelines about how we're going to invest the Department of Energy monies. We have to save more energy than it costs to install. Um, we have to meet the current ventilation standards. And so there's a lot of training and certification of the people that are managing this work. I am certified by the, uh, what is it, the uh, Building Performance Institute. And because I work on multifamily buildings, we've, we're working on uh, training and certification with the Air Barriers Association of America to do whole building testing of apartment buildings. We uh, put together scopes of work in consultation with the building owner, and we agree on a, a body of work to bring forward. Uh, and then, you know, we change how the building works. And because we change how the building works, it requires different um, maintenance. It requires um, people will change in their house. The fans that didn't work very well before now work really well. Um, the maintenance requirements for the mechanical ventilation system will require more work than they did before. We're very committed to training people about their new place. Right now, um, we're working COVID safely. And that means we develop a COVID safety plan for all of the work that we do. We work with the property managers and with the residents to make sure that uh, everybody follows the right protocols. And then one of the uh, standards of an energy audit is we measure things. We measure how good the ventilation system was before we started. We measure how good it is after we're done. We measure how leaky the building is before we started and we measure how leaky the building is when we're done. Um, we have a lot of focus on um, on moisture within the building. And so we're always uh, measuring the relative humidity inside of the union. And usually we're trying to dry out a building. We're also uh, at King County Housing Authority. Um, we have taken it upon ourselves to put all of our properties in the uh, EPA Energy Star uh, Portfolio Manager. So the other thing that we track is the energy consumption of the building before we did the work and how it performs after we do the work. The other thing um, in my department that we really focus on is that when we're done, the building owner doesn't have to do anything more. When we're done, we're done. And what we expect from the building owner is that they maintain the equipment that we install uh, we will train people about how to maintain that equipment that uh, we train the man, we train the maintenance staff. So people wanted to see some of the projects that, uh, that I have worked on in the recent past. And the one that, uh, so this one's Spirit Wood Manor, it's uh, 14 buildings. They're all two story wood frame structures. Um, and in the bottom left is the chart from uh, portfolio manager 
that tracks the energy consumption of the whole site. Uh, we finished in 2017. So the top left of that curve is what the energy was consumed in the middle of the winter. And we've been able to knock that down, I don't know, at least 20%. The, uh, the bottom right chart is the, uh, the blower door readings of the whole building, of every building out there, uh, before and after. And we were able to cut the air leakage of the building uh, in half. This is a building that was built in the 70s. There is existing insulation in the walls before we started. Um, it had been insulated an awful lot before we got there. It was not in good repair when we started the work. Um, and so uh, we were able to dense pack a wall that already had a bat in the wall. This is one that was recently completed. Wood Creek Lane is just two buildings, uh, 20 apartments, a 12-plex and an 8-plex. Um, you can see on the bottom left chart, we've been able to knock the, uh, the energy consumption of the building more than 20%. The, um, on the bottom right is the, uh, is the agreement that we reached with the owner before we started work. Um, you'll know that it didn't cost the building owner any money at all, that uh, we, uh, we work an awful lot with our local electric utility, and they paid for most of the cost of adding insulation to that wall. Uh, we were able to, um, we removed the fireplaces actually at Wood Creek Lane, and where the fireplace hearth was, we put a ductless heat pump. Um, we did lighting, we did weather strip kits. Uh, let me think. We were uh, $8,278 per unit to do this work without any contribution from the building owner. What we want the building owner to do when we're done is uh, maintain those ductless heat pumps and maintain those uh, upgraded mechanical ventilation. And actually, you know, part of doing the work at, um, at Wood Creek Lane comes to mind is that um, it had existing bathroom exhaust fans that were not ducted to the outside. And the ones that were ducted to the outside, you know, were disconnected at the perimeter of the building. So we spent a lot of time in part of the work when you do uh, the dense pack work is you inspect every square foot of the exterior envelope of the building and you find these ducts that aren't connected to the outside. And when you put in a fan that runs an awful lot, it's really important that you get that air outside of the building. So uh, that was part of the scope. Heritage Park Apartments is another property that we've done. Uh, the budget there is on the bottom left. We spent uh, $6,812 per unit at uh, Heritage Park Apartments. And the building owner had contribution in it primarily because uh, the $40,000 they had for the fireplacing fireplaces, when we removed the fireplaces at Heritage Park, what we installed was a uh, electric fireplace. So they still have the illusion of a fireplace at Heritage Park Apartments, but it cannot burn wood. Uh, above the, the hearth, the electric fireplace, is the interior head of the ductless heat pump. So uh, there's heating and cooling going on there, but uh, there's no wood burning. And then um, actually the building owner helped us retrofit all of the lighting at Heritage Park Apartments. They had uh, their own crews were changing out fixtures. So we just bought all of the fixtures and they replaced the fixtures at Heritage Park. On the bottom right is the, uh, is the chart from uh, portfolio manager that speaks to the energy savings there. Those are my projects. So here's a picture of us dense packing walls, actually our contractor, uh, dense packing walls at a different project. Um, 
and inspecting all of the wall caps for uh, how the air leaves the apartment. There's a kitchen range hood and a, and a bathroom fan, and we replaced all of those caps and, and dense packed that rim joist that it comes out in and air sealed that cavity at the perimeter. We install an awful lot of uh, energy recovery ventilation and heat recovery ventilation. Uh, our two most popular ones right now are the, uh, on the right is the, uh, they call it the Whisper Comfort. It's made by Panasonic and it has a, uh, a duct that comes out the end of it that penetrates the wall. Um, you can see that in the middle picture in the, uh, the wall cap is on the left and on the right is what the duct work looks like before it's attached to that wall cap and see how the ductwork is split in half. And one of them is one side of that wall cap is bringing air in and the other side is letting the air out. Uh, that lets you put a uh, ERV in the ceiling of a townhome and bring in fresh air and exhaust stale air. And that has a profound effect on the indoor air quality of that apartment. It has a kitchen range hood fan. It has a bathroom fan, but those only work when they need them. But the uh, energy recovery ventilator, the one from Panasonic, is running 24-7. The one on the left, up in the bottom, up in the top left corner, is the, uh, it's a heat recovery ventilator. It's made by a company called Vents US, and it's a through-the-wall uh, energy recovery ventilator. Um, they have a small one and they have a larger one. Uh, we like these an awful lot because they're so easy to install. There isn't a lot of ductwork and it goes right out through the wall. Sometimes you have problems with, uh, you don't want to mess with the uh, texture of the ceiling, or if you have fire rated assemblies, you don't want to mess with those. But the uh, through the wall HRVs are something that we're installing in all of our projects now. We also install a lot of ductless heat pumps. These are the ductless heat pumps. The picture on the bottom right are the ones that were installed at Wood Creek Lane, where the uh, all of the outdoor units are mounted on that old fireplace chase for all of the apartments. Um, and then on the bottom left is a, a single outdoor unit. In the middle is what the interior head of the uh, of the ductless heat pump looks like in the apartment. So we're removing a baseboard heater and taking the circuit that's associated with that baseboard heater typically and um, empowering the ductless heat pump. Those are the measures that we do in multifamily weatherization to uh, lower the utility bill and improve the indoor air quality. Thank you. And back to you, Kelly. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, at this point, we're now transitioning from the presentation mode to the live panel question and answer mode. Um, so I'm going to ask each of our three speakers to turn on their cameras and take themselves off mute. Um, and we will launch in a Q&A. Um, so please, there's still plenty of time to type in your questions um, into the Q&A function within Zoom. And also, again, I wanted to welcome Erica Burren, uh, program manager uh, with DOE's Weatherization Assistance Program. I'm here to answer a question and answer in uh, Amy said. So welcome, Erica. Okay, so with that, Thank we you. will get started Thanks. with the um, Q&A. So Paul, I'm gonna start with a couple questions for you. Um, so air sealing seems to be an important step in weatherization. Um, what common locations need air sealing? That's a really good question. A lot of people think it's the doors and the windows, and it really isn't. Uh, some of the biggest locations are where you have, um, like Chase's plumbing stacks going into the attic. They may not be sealed around. You might have like a square opening for a round pipe, and that's not sealed. Soffits up in the soffit areas, oftentimes again up in the attic, can be really wide open. Balloon framing, which is an older type of construction when we had more heavy timber, 
but you'll see it in a lot of older neighborhoods, such as in Chicago, the entire perimeter is just wide open basement to attic. So we're, a lot of times what we're looking at is wherever there are junctions between different sections of the building or penetrations for plumbing, electrical, uh, things like that. Also, oftentimes, if you open the, the cabinet underneath the sink, you'll see a big opening for the plumbing pipe to go through, and that can be open all the way to outside. So a lot of those sorts of uh, areas. Okay, great, thanks. And um, another question on, on the weatherization. Um, so you, you had mentioned this. Um, what types of pre-existing issues should weatherization not necessarily address? Yeah, so what that really comes down to is with the limited funding that we have and with, where you do have to be able to save energy, it's really health and safety issues that are not associated with the weatherization measures themselves or health and safety, maybe it would be associated with the weatherization measures, but it would use the entire budget or more. So when you have really extensive mold, when you have, um, you know, roofs that are caving in, when you have rotting staircases or, or decks or porches, um, you know, we, we don't have the funds to be able to remove vermiculite insulation that may contain asbestos. So those sorts of things that are just beyond what we can do with the limited scope in the budget. And that's where having these, you know, leveraging these resources can come in so handy so that we can remove those barriers and be able to do complete weatherization of the home. Great, thank you. Um, so Erica, a question for you. Um, it's great to hear that the WAP program is anticipating a significant increase in funding due to some passing of some recent legislation, potentially. Um, so if I am interested in participating, where is the best place to look to identify who my local or state um, weatherization assistance program agency is to be able to learn more and apply? Sure, if you want to figure out where to apply or where your local agency is, I will put in the link to the where to apply on the DWE website. It will get you your local weatherization partner should you like to work with them on um, any of the forthcoming funding opportunity announcements. I will. Okay, great. Thanks, Erica. So we will look for that in the chat um, here momentarily. Um, so maybe a question both for Paul and then Dan as well, since you had touched on this. Um, so how important is communication with the occupant during the weatherization process? And what information is typically relayed to the occupant as part of the process? Maybe Dan, if you want to start there with that, and I'll then pass it to Paul. You know, right now, working COVID safe, um, you know, we're speaking to the residents. Sometimes we, you know, we're, we have to go into the apartment. So we want to find out if they're healthy. Uh, there's a lot of communication that happens just working COVID safe. But, you know, developing a scope of work. Uh, one of the pictures in my slides was, you know, there's community meetings that we participate in. We find out what are the issues that the residents want us to address. You know, we talk to the building owner and the, and the maintenance staff to find out what their issues are. But there's a lot of communication with the residents. And then when we put in new materials, we're always training people how to run that new thermostat. Uh, you know, what the new fan means. We show them measurements of the fan. This is what the fan is actually doing. Uh, there's a lot of communication with the residents. Great. Anything you'd like to add to that, Paul? Sure. And so you know, Dan's experience there, he's working on larger buildings where you've got maybe different people who are owners versus occupants. In the single family, you know, we, we're talking about people who are both owner and occupant. So we, one thing we really need to do is make sure they are clear on what we are doing yeah, and also what we are not doing. Yeah, I mentioned doors and windows uh, several times in my talk and in my previous uh, question. A lot of people think that they're gonna get all new windows and that's not necessarily the case. So you need to set up the expectations in advance so that they know this is what the scope is, this is what the scope isn't, these are the sorts of things we're going to be doing. But one thing we also have to recognize is these residents, they've been living in this house for a long time. They might not know the science behind it, they might not know why things are not going well or what to do about it, but they experience the effects every single day. We may show up in the summer 
and not be feeling the problems they have in the winter. So in that communication, it really is two-way communication. We wanna make sure they know what we're gonna be able to do, but they can tell us what the problems are that they've been experiencing in their home so that we are then able to take special you know, care to look at those areas. You know, why is that room cold? Why is, do you continue to get little spots of mold in this, in this room? So you know, getting that two-way con conversation going, getting them to trust you so that you can get more information about their home. And, and then on the back end, here is what we're going to do. We've gone through the home. Here are the measures that we're going to implement. And here's the process by which it will happen. Contractors or crews will come in. There will be a final inspection at the end to make sure everything was done properly. Great, thanks so much, Paul. Um, so Deanna, a question for you, because you were talking about kind of ASHRAE standards. Um, so, so when ASHRAE releases revised ventilation standards, um, how soon are those typically incorporated into the weatherization program? Um, and then maybe specifically in Washington State, um, what, what um, ASHRAE standards and or, or year of the standard um, is typically being used and required within the weatherization program? You know, we, we use the most current one, um, and I'm not really down with the Bible and verse of ASHRAE connections, because, you know, <clears throat> what I'm usually seeing is an apartment building full of fans that don't move air at all. And, and we'll develop a standard around a certain, you know, the one bedroom model or the two bedroom model. And we try and meet the standard with an ERV, right? We want to make sure that, um, you know, the spot ventilation works, that they have a kitchen range hood fan, that they have a bathroom exhaust fan. But we try and meet the, uh, the ASHRAE standard with an ERV. So that if they have, they burn the toast, yeah, you can turn on the kitchen range hood and get that bad air out of the apartment. But just on a day-to-day, -day, moment to moment basis, to put fresh air into an apartment is uh, is really profoundly has a profound impact on that household. It really does. So um, I think the most current standard, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, Paul would know this, is the 2016 ASHRAE standard. For the residents and then we have um uh, what's the standard for the common area we also have a common area so we have some common area hallways so we meet a ventilation standard as well the most current one but you know what we usually find is there's no standard there we go there and there's no ventilation in the hallway so we put in ventilation and um and we try and do it why we recover the heat Gotcha. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is it it's 62.1 and 62.2? Are those the specific ASHRAE standards that we're talking about? Uh, someone had asked on the chat. 62.2 is for the residents and 62.1 is for the common areas. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so Erica, um, so Amy had mentioned in the presentation that there is a forthcoming notice update to uh, for eligibility. Um, in the weatherization assistance program. Um, is there anything that you might like to add about what potentially to expect in the new notice that's coming out? Um, I'm hoping very shortly, I'm sorry I turned my video off because my sound quality was poor. Um, <clears throat> we, it is made it through legal. We're just waiting on the final internal approvals so that um, we can get that categorical eligibility out to the network. Okay, great. And um, Amy had also, she had this great slide with all of the different, um, the four different groups of the grants. And we've had a couple questions come in, um, either to be able to potentially kind of restate those and walk through those, or also maybe you could type those in chat. Um, I think several folks were trying to jot those down quickly and, and may have missed them. Um, so I don't know if you maybe want to speak a little bit more about them, or if you want to use the chat function to, to share that with everybody. Um. I can talk about them real quickly again, and then um, I'm sure when the slides are distributed, they'll have a little reference. Um, community scale and the Sustainable Energy Resources for Consumers, or CERC, those are specific to WAP grantees in the network, um, first of all. And community scale is for place-based initiatives to um, weatherize whole neighborhoods or large clusters of buildings. CERC is um, for primarily for renewable technologies. The other um, wider funding opportunity is enhancement and innovation. 
And there are four different purposes under that competitive funding that would be open to those outside of the existing weatherization network. And th that's the one that Amy talked about is available for deferrals, workforce, into our air quality and renewable deployment in the program. Okay, great. Thanks, Erica. And um, I, I think Amy may have mentioned that there are some programs that kind of have uh, maybe a single application for multiple services. Do any of those programs that you just mentioned kind of fit under that? So kind of one point of application to be able to access um, these different um, uh, funding streams or, or services. I think Paul talked about some of the one-stop application um, places that it that kind of activity is very different across the 700 local agencies and the 57 grantees. Um, some places it's very coordinated and other places it is not. Gotcha. Paul, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I've, I've seen it in action in uh, like New Hampshire. They really have a good, a really strong one-stop uh, application. And so it's something like six different programs. And so the resident can kind of just check, yes, I'm interested in this one. Yes, I'm interested in this one. And depending on, I mean, not every program has the same eligibility requirements. So they can say these are the ones they're interested in. But then if they are eligible, they've already basically put in the application. It's a really nice way to, you know, not have six people knocking on their door, calling them up to say, hey, are you interested? So I, I think it's a really nice model. And I, as Erica says, it's, it's not at all uniform or even necessarily widespread. So it is something I would like to see expand. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, so Dan, let me ask you, one, you had mentioned um, the uh, dense packing when you were kind of talking through some of your examples. Could you kind of explain yeah. what that is? You know, it's um, it's a way to insulate a wall. With uh, we use cellulose out here, and we and it's a it's a enclosed cavity, and you drill a hole and you snake a hose up the up the cavity, and then you turn on the machine, and under high pressure, you dense pack material in there. And what we found, and this is kind of diff this is really different than single family, is um. Multifamily buildings leak everywhere, a little bit everywhere. And when, we, when we're weatherizing these apartment buildings, what we do is we work all the way around the building and we dense pack the walls that have an existing bat in them. And we found that, you know, if, it's, if the building was built two years ago or 40 years ago, we can have a real big impact on the air leakage of the building. And it isn't the big holes. It's those million little holes that we're able to air seal because we do dense pack work under high pressure. So it requires a really well-trained crew. Um, and you know what happens is it becomes real easy to control the air in the apartment so that when, you know, um, so you don't have all this outdoor air leakage coming in. And the fresh air that comes in through the window or the ERV is truly fresh air. So we do that a lot with dense pack. We dense pack rim joists and walls and floors if we can. And now we're starting to venture into aero seals so that we can air seal an apartment down to zero leakage, really. Cost effectively. It's, it's great. <laughs> great, thanks, Dan. Um, so Paul, let me ask you kind of a, a in the weeds technical question as well. Um, so can you describe, you showed a photo of uh, blower door testing. So what exactly does that entail? Sure, so the blower door test is um, the way we determine first how much the house leaks in the first place. And then if we are, um, if we use some other techniques that allows us to also help to identify where in the house these leaks are, where the bigger leaks are. And so what you do is you open the, usually the front door, but you know, it could be any door, pretty much exterior door, put in this frame that's got this red panel that I showed in my slide with the big fan. And then you open the fan and you turn it on and you see how much airflow do you need to move in order to change the pressure in the house by a certain amount, typically 50 Pascals. And you know, in a, in a really tight house, it's not gonna be very hard to depressurize that house by 50 Pascals. Think about, 
how hard is it to suck water up a straw that's got a bunch of holes in it versus a straw that doesn't have a bunch of holes in it. So it's the same kind of idea. So in a leaky house, you have to move a whole lot of air and then you can walk around and you can feel for leaks. You can see evidence of leaks like spider webs fluttering around. Uh, and there are some other techniques that you can identify are the big leaks between the house and the attic, between the house and the crawl space, or, or where are they? So and it's, a, it's a standard test. It's used in new construction as well with codes requiring certain maximum air leakage levels, but it, it was really pioneered in the retrofit industry. Great, thank you. So Kelly, we yeah. do that same test on apartment buildings where we depressurize every apartment in the building to the same 50 pascals and measure how leaky it was before we start. And then, um, you know, working with the utility out here, we're getting about 30% reduction in apartment buildings that we're working on. Would it be safe to assume that apartments are even more leaky than us? Uh, no, no they're, 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 a lot, they're a lot tighter. They just, they leak in really different ways than houses do. They really do. Oh, very interesting. Um, so Erica, I, I know we've got here attending today lots of folks from HUD and from public housing authorities. I mean, uh, um, Amy had talked about the new kind of and evolving HUD program. So, but but if the weatherization weatherization assistance program, excuse me, um, HUD eligibility changes soon, um, when might those changes occur? Well, the guidance would say that they were effective immediately. So there wouldn't be any delay. I just want to point out that in weatherization, it's the individual client who's eligible for weatherization. It's not the landlord. It is the individual low-income family. Okay, yep. understood. Thank you. Um, so Dan, question for you. Um, so in the examples that you had shared, um, are the utilities at these properties typically resident or owner paid? And really does that have any sort of bearing um, or typically impact what types of weatherization measures could be implemented at the property? Sure, sure. You know, the, we need to make sure that the benefits of the DOE expenditures accrue to the residents, right? So we don't wanna work on just the common area lighting, for the building owner, right? Um, we're going to work on the lighting for the residents, or you know, uh, make sure that the benefit occurs to the residents. It's real common in my neck of the woods that uh, apartments are individually metered, so um, people will notice a difference in their actual utility bill. Um, and you know, part of the energy auditing process is to find sometimes the most cost-effective work to do is in the common area. But if you're going to lower the utility bill for the for the owner of the building, how can those benefits be uh, transferred to the people who live there, right? And a lot of times, it's um, you know, if if the building owner has the same mission statement as us, and they're having a hard time. Um, maintaining the building and you're able to improve the efficiency of the building and improve the indoor air quality of the building. Um, it's a win-win situation for the program, for the residents, for the building owner. That's, that's really super common uh, because they don't have the resources or they don't have the technical, technical abilities to look at what efficiencies could be. We're looking at it with a different lens than they are. They're just trying to maintain the building and we're going to improve it. Great. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Um, uh, Paul, a question for you. So in addition to weatherizing a home for health and safety against current conditions, um, does the weatherization assistance program, um, is it considering and, and potentially implementing measures that in, are anticipating kind of future long-term changes such as from climate change? So um, see if Erica has a different response than I do. At this time, not really. The focus is really, uh, to, my, uh, on, to my understanding and experience, the focus is really on improving the lives and the situation for the family that lives there now. Um, there are some very minor areas in which that might be a little bit different. For example, with the ventilation, say you have a large house with only one person living in it. 
we're still going to ventilate the home as though it would be occupied to its design three bedroom house we would assume four people so we would still install ventilation based on that number of people i know there's interest a lot of interest in having weatherization do things that account for things like longer term climate change but i don't think that that is really in there yet and erica can confirm or deny that i would expect oh thanks paul no <laughs> um i would say that we're looking at lots of things um it takes a while for um some of the science and evaluations to come in we all know that climate change is real how we would look at resiliency. And I guess, you know, part of me would argue that energy efficiency, air sealing and insulation, insulation does create resiliency for the housing stock that we're working on. And all of those are additional benefits just for doing the energy efficiency work. Doesn't mean that there aren't other things that we need to look at, um, but I don't have definitive answers for anybody today, unfortunately. Yeah, so if I can just follow up a little bit, you know, just like with health and safety, we know that there are things where we're not going in necessarily focused on improving health and safety in a certain area, but the evidence shows that it does. And I think, as Erica says, a lot of what we do is improving resiliency, is addressing some of these things, but it's not as though that is the focus, and it's not as though we are potentially putting resources in that are not cost effective from an energy basis because of these other things. It still is supposed to be cost effective from an energy basis. And to the extent that we get additional benefits, great. Great, thank you. Um, so we still have a few more minutes. So if anybody has some burning questions, please make sure to get those in the chat. I'm, I got a, I've got a couple more in the queue here. Um, so Dan, question for you. Um, in addition to um, the ERVs, which I believe you had mentioned, energy recovery ventilators, um, yeah. does King County also install spot ventilation for baths and kitchens? Yeah, we do. We do. Um, and you know, there was a time a few years ago that we would meet ASHRAE with just the bathroom exhaust fan. Um, and you know, at this point, I'm working on buildings that have replaced the bathroom exhaust fan. Um, and we can meet ASHRAE with an energy recovery ventilator. So the, the exhaust only ventilation system, we will turn it off and we will install an ERV and meet the ASHRAE standard. And the building is left with a effective spot ventilation and an ERV, but it depends. Every, every building's different. Every building presents a different opportunity. I'm working on one up north here that, uh, you know, every one of the kitchen range hoods was broken. So we're putting in, uh, there's a new uh, fan made by Air King, a kitchen range hood fan that runs continuously. And, you know, it, it depends on what the opportunity presents on every one of these audits. And, and making sure that the people that are looking at the work, the people that are auditing the work, are aware of things that are available to bring to the building that will have a really big impact on what it means. And, you know, and people live there. So, you know, around here, we get um, a lot of wood smoke every summer because of the fires. And so, you know, we need to talk to people about what do they do when they get a lot of fires and we have an exhaust a, a ventilation system that's pulling that air in, you know, um, yeah. It's a changing world, it really is. Great, thank you. Um, so um, Erica, let me ask you, do all weatherization agencies offer weatherization plus health or is it kind of just focused on the weatherization aspect or? No, um, the individual agencies and in many cases assisted by efforts at the state level um, because a lot of those plus health items, those additives are from other funding sources. Um, the benefit of using weatherization agencies in the program is there we're a deployment program. We have a nationwide network of trained individuals um, and they're ready, willing and able to assist low income households. They have good reputations and connections in their communities. But it's the plus health piece, at least from the DOE perspective, is about braiding all of those different resources in order to cover those very important plus health added measures. 
I don't know, I'm sure um, Dan or Paul could probably speak to it a little better, um, but it's very different across the country. Sure, Dan or Paul, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, let me just say, we have great partners up here with the energy utilities. And, you know, they've recognized energy conservation is one of their resources for a long time. And it's been, it's really great working with them because they make our dollar go a lot further. And yeah, it is, it's one of my, my jobs is to break that funding, that's for sure. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, and since we are now at um, half past the hour, we do have to conclude our session. Um, so we got a number of questions asking about access to the slides. Um, maybe you had some trouble reading some of the content on the slides. Um, so there's a couple kind of resources. So we are working to get um, all of the links and resources and information shared with attendees in the session. Um, you will also be able to view the slides um, in kind of high def. Um, when the videos get posted on HUD's YouTube channel here in a couple weeks. Um, um, if you check some, I know some links were pasted into the chat feature, so check that as well. Um, and then finally, you're also welcome to um, contact um, the today's speakers if you'd like to receive a copy of their presentation. Um, but any, anyways, thank you um, everybody for attending today and a big thank you to our technical speakers in today's session for their presentations and also a especially huge thank you to the audience for attending the session today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Good to see you, Paul. Good to see you, Dan and Eric.